Many believe that leaders are born. They have something others don't. They have the vision and the ability to inspire. But that's an old idea. The concept of exceptionality proves that leaders can be made. You can choose to be a leader. And that's an important choice a lot of people make when they grow from being good to great. So what is leadership all about? Is there a formula for success here? Corporate trainer Tarunjit, who has studied behavioral science and worked with over a hundred corporates, has some of the answers. If you really study success literature, literature on leadership success, there are a few patterns that do emerge. And I'm going to refer to a couple of sources. One is McClellan's work, fundamental work. And McClellan spoke about, just to recap, three needs. The need for achievement, the need for power, and the need for affiliation. Now, one would ex expect that leaders would typically be people with high needs for achievement because that's what leaders do. They achieve great things. What McClellan found was obsessive drives for achievement were great for entrepreneurs, right? Because their, their will prevails, they run it the way they want and they will just achieve the races against themselves. Uh, uh, they, they always like feedback from the environment on whether they're doing well, great leadership traits. But he found that when you get into managing others, a very high need for achievement may not be desirable. Hmm. What works there is a need for power or influence, the need, the, a, a driven desire to influence the others and take the others with me. Achievement is critical, but for managers and leaders in organizations, the need for affiliation needs to be a little subservient for a need to a need for power. And there are certain characters, uh, traits that uh, or behaviors that leaders do, which we can look at. There, there, there is a set that yeah, would, would pretty much, except for a few outliers here and there, you'd find that they would fall into that character. And what are these? You know, when they look at enterprising people, mm. uh, they looked at what, what drove them, uh, how did they go about their business? What gave them success? How did they deal with failures? Uh, Manford, in our in our uh, in our research, we, we we came up with about ten to twelve of these behaviors. But I'm going to pick up the top five, top four or five here, and they are commonsensical. But you'll see how beautifully they play out. The first real law of success, if I may call it, it's like the law of gravity. There's no point disputing it because it exists, and there's enough evidence to produce uh, to carry this forward. The first one is to realize. Lead enterprising people are deeply, passionately committed. You know, somewhere we, we spoke about the limbic system and we spoke about the hijacks, etc. But without that passion, you'd never produce greatness, madness. Right? There was madness in the way Steve Jobs went about creating that. He, he got upset about a start and stop button on, on the device. Right? Now, enterprising people are so passionately committed. And you can see it across. You'll see it in the world. You'll see it in the organization world. But it's beautiful to see it in sports. The year was 1993, and at Wimbledon, there was this reigning world champion called Steffi Graf. And there was this unseeded player called Jana Novotra from Czechoslovakia who made it to the final. And true to Wimbledon form, the, the crowd started cheering for the underdog. The underdog did well, won the first, uh, lost the first set, won the second set was leading 4-1 in the third set, a matter of time before she left Wimbledon. But Steffi being Steffi, she went and she went ahead and won the match. You would typically see tennis players going ahead, shaking hands. Jana Novotna fell into a heap and started crying. Mm. I mean, it's a famous incident that when the prize distribution happened, she was sobbing on the shoulder of the Duchess of Kent. Because somewhere she was so committed to a thing called winning, when the plaque was being handed over to Steffi, she almost put out a hand as if to say, that belongs to me. And I remember a newspaper in India carrying the headline the next day. You would have expected them to say, you know, Steffi wins her 7th, 8th, whatever Wimbledon it was. Instead, they chose to say, Yana Novotna loses Wimbledon. There was so much commitment there for the world to see. But very often, people take passion and commitment to be momentary bursts, but it's anything but that. But how do you do that? How do you maintain the passion and commitment Int as you go through the journey? Internal drive. Because the need to achieve is internally. It's, it's not because somebody asked me to do it. Go back to the studies in Kakinada that McClellan did. Mm. He found that the folks who did it were largely large. There is a, uh, there's an influence of the environment, but they did it for themselves. 
the drive is so who told airtel to become the fifth largest telecom company in the world they just went ahead and did it mm. right the drive just doesn't cease you know there's a there's a quote from our scriptures from the upanishads which really describes this beautifully and it goes like this it says you are what your deep driving mm. desire is as your desire is so is your will as your will is so is your deed and as your deed is so is your destiny and it all starts with what your deep driving desire is so a desire to really succeed and that's a quality all leaders have shown the desire to lead and succeed but most of the leaders have different needs and varying expectations in a challenging environment where pressures are many and competition tough how does a leader adapt to the changing situations and take others in the path to success i think the question goes back to how do i change hmm. uh, how do i really change a pattern that's successful and why do i need to change they say it no if it isn't broken why fix it but it dealt my my leadership style dealt with a situation if the situation changes my style needs to change now any change goes through a couple of stages at first you will deny the change right when we work with organizations that are going through mergers and acquisitions there's always a denial that no this isn't happening but when it happens you move into a stage called resistance you resist it tooth and nail i don't want this i don't want this right once and and people spend a lot of time in resistance you then decide after after resisting it for a while when you realize resistance is futile and i'm talking about people who manage to change successfully those who don't will keep slipping back mm. from resistance they move into exploring okay this is happening there's no point resisting it why don't i explore what's happening and i explore what i can change and change gets cemented when there's a commitment to that exploration mm. so that's a cycle typically for any change now that cycle is not easy that cycle takes years to to mm. really master and uh, we see uh, since we, since we deal with you know typically high potential ceos high performers in any organization we find that for them this resistance is uh, is is a fair bit Mm. but i have done so well tarun they'll tell you so why do i need to change there's nothing wrong with you the context has changed and can you just be relevant to that context and once you understand that everything else becomes easy behavioral science has shown that many exceptional leaders show similar patterns and these can be developed in anyone tarun explains how we can do this and more when we return